Okay, don't know if you've done scatter plots before. Um, if you had been in our curriculum, you'd seen this for at least two years. But if you've never seen scatter plots, it's pretty standard um, material. It's not too challenging. However, if you've never seen it before, uh, a little bit overwhelming at first, uh, make sure you watch the video a couple times. All right, lots of uh, objectives here. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't show you the homework. Homework's going to be worksheets attached to the uh, email. All right, so we're doing scatter plots. So here's an example of a real honest to God scatter plot I got off the internet. Um, it's a, a scatter plot that shows uh, heights and weights of individuals. Each one of those red dots there represents an individual's in uh, their their height and their weight. So each red dot is an ordered pair. It's got an X and a Y. The X axis there is their height in inches. And the Y axis there is their weight in pounds. And altogether, this... Um, this type of plot right here is called a scatter plot. So two main things here. First and foremost, so each one of those dots, like I said, relates two different sets of data. So for instance, it's one basic concept. However, it's broken down into two individual data or data points. One will be applied for the x-axis and will be applied for the y-axis. That really sounds really complicated. It's not. It's one point that has two bits of data. If I use some fancy words, we call it bivariate data. That's data that individually has two elements to it. So for instance, two numbers, your number of brothers, your number of sisters, that would give you two individual data points. Uh, and you could plot those points as an ordered pair. So most scatter plots um, in the real world uh, contain mostly just positive data. So there are some occasions where we'd have some negative data. So we actually plot these. This is plot. You can't tell from the scatter plot right here, but it's actually plotted on the X, Y coordinate plane. But since the data here, no one can have a negative height or a negative weight. Uh, since the data here is only positive, it only occupies quadrant one. So when you see a scatter plot, typically you're only looking in quadrant one of the coordinate plane. Now we're going to make some scatter plots. We're going to interpret some scatter plots as well, too. And the reason why scientists um, uh, and people use scatter plots is to show a pattern or to, to seek out if a pattern actually uh, emerges from the data. And as we can see here, it's a little bit fuzzy, but we can see a general pattern that's uh, the data it comes from the lower left hand corner and it's moving upwards to the upper right hand corner. And that kind of makes sense. Uh, the more the, the taller you are, the larger your body, the more weight you would have. All right, so uh, these are a stylistic uh, version of scatter plots here. A math teacher made all these. Uh, most of the times, true scatter plots will have far more dots than what you see right here. Uh, and the dots are usually spread out just a, just a, a bit more than uh, we kind of exaggerate it in math books right here. But this gives you the general idea. There are three main patterns that will appear when you do a scatter plot. So the first one there is the one on the left there. And it looks like as the X values increase, so do the Ys. So we use scatter plots to identify if something's happening with the data. Is there a trend with those two variables? Remember, it's an X and a Y um, uh, portion of the data. So it's bivariate. Um, so let's see. Some examples of that would be, oh, and I'm sorry. And the big fancy word that we use if a pattern does exist uh, is correlation. And correlation is just a fancy word that describes that, 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 that a pattern is in the data itself. Now, the patterns can vary. The one there on the left, uh, if it, it, it goes in an upward direction from left to right. And so if you could imagine it as a line, well, then that line would have a positive slope. And therefore, we say it has positive correlation. Now, how do we relate this? Well, here are two examples. Um, as you go, as you grow older, you get taller. So if we were to plot your height and age from, say, year zero to up to, say, I don't know, uh, to the ninth grade, uh, then you would see a, uh, a pattern emerge somewhat like what the one there is on the left. Here's another one. Uh, the more chores you do, typically the larger allowance you get. That's not always the case, but uh, for some time that is true. So how about for the middle one? Well, the middle one, if we were to draw a line through the data, it would be in a downward um, um, trend. Uh, therefore, uh, if that slope of that line would be negative, so we say this one has negative correlation. That doesn't mean no correlation. That means negative correlation. That means as the X value increases, 
the Y values are decreasing. So here's a couple of examples of this. Um, what's your grade level? Hey, I'm in the fifth grade. I'm in the sixth grade. I'm the seventh grade. As you get older, your grades increases. That would be your X values. The number of baby teeth you have in your head would decrease. Um, as your as the weight of your car increases, then your miles per gallon would decrease. And the last one, even though it doesn't look like there's a pattern, we call no pattern a pattern. So when there is no pattern, we say that there is no correlation. So the only one you typically confuse is negative and no correlation. So negative means the data is dropping from left to right in a downward trend. And when there's no correlation, it's just a random series of dots all over quadrant one. So some exa so this would be an example of when things have have nothing in common with each other. For instance, your age and say the the last four numbers of your cell phone number. I mean, there's no relationship between how old you are and your phone number or the number of pets to your height. Uh, there's no relation between those two numbers. And so if you were to make a scatter plot of that data, you would get something that would look like there on the right. All right, so the big idea here on this screen is correlation. Correlation can be positive, negative, or not have any. We say no correlation. All right, uh, I'm going to further this idea just uh, slightly more. So when the dots, okay, that one has a negative correlation right here. Uh, but if the dots were more bunched together, and if I continue to bunch them together, I would eventually bunch those data points and make a nice straight line there. We give these three ideas where even though there's negative correlation for all three of these, it's just more finely defined there on the one on the right. In other words, the data isn't spread out much. So we would call that perfect correlation. That rarely happens, perfect correlation. Uh, on the opposite scale, that would be weak correlation. And in the middle, we would say strong correlation. So when scientists make scatter plots, typically they never will get perfect correlation. That means there can't be any outliers. There's always that one kid uh, that no matter how much he eats, he never gets fat, that sort of thing. But generally, the more you eat, the fatter you get, that sort of thing. Um, and so you would see if you made a, tr uh, um, a, um, a scatter plot of calorie intake, how many calories you eat uh, versus versus um well, actually that was giving you a positive correlation there um so for instance the uh, amount of money that you spend the amount of money you have left in your bank account would have a negative correlation the opposite of that would be a positive correlation and once again if it makes a perfect line we say it's got perfect cor positive correlation uh strong correlation and if it's kind of fuzzy but it's the general trend is in an upward direction that would be a weak positive correlation and that's the one I was just telling you there is that the more calories you eat, the, the heavier you should be. And there's always that one kid that can eat a lot and uh, not gain any weight. And then there's the, the one kid that can eat a little bit and still gain weight. All right. So that's this idea of correlation. So how do you make a scatter plot? So we're going to be making a scatter plot for homework. So you will be given bivariate data data that has two two individual numbers that make up each individual number point so let's say uh you grab a, a thermometer and you this is in meters and you go to certain levels of elevation in the atmosphere and take the temperature so for instance if i looking at this at uh an altitude of zero meters at sea level the temperature is 59 degrees fahrenheit at say 2000 meters, we've got 41.6 uh, degrees Fahrenheit. And as you can see, as the as your altitude uh, increases, your um, uh, your your temperature is decreasing. This should be a negative correlation. So the hardest part of making this, and for your homework, the same thing, is deciding the tick marks to use for your quadrant one. And if you notice, uh, X would be your altitude, Y would be your temperature. Uh, for my X values, uh, my lowest number is zero. Okay, that makes sense. But your highest number is 5,000. So we can't have 5,000 tick marks. Um, so you have to make a judgment call. Generally speaking, we like between five and 10 tick marks. So if we were to go by, say, I don't know, 500 feet at a time, then you would wind up with um, um, a, a, you know, a, a, a lot of tick marks there because we're going all the way up to 5,000.
Uh, you definitely don't want to go by ones or by fifties. If you went by a thousand, let's see, that would be five tick marks. If you went by 500, that would be 10 tick marks. Um, and that would probably be a good number right there. Uh, temperature is a little bit harder to see there. It looks like the smallest number there is 0 0.6 and the largest number there is 61.3. So if we went by one, that would have to be, you know, 62 tick marks. Uh, if you went by, uh, I don't know, twos, that would be 31 tick marks. If we go by fives, well, I, I think going by tens would be a good idea. So if we went by tens, we would have seven tick marks. And once you once you decide those tick marks, then to plot each point there, for instance, the first point there on the, the far left, zero degrees for altitude and 59 degrees for Fahrenheit, you'd wind up with a scatter plot that would look like this. So that first point there on the left, zero and it's almost to 60 would be that first red dot there on the left and then you can see the dots now the dots aren't perfect they don't make a, a perfectly straight line there's definitely strong negative correlation going on here and that is the case if you ever drive up pike's peak you know you notice that the, at the bottom during the summertime it could be 80 degrees and the top it could be 30 degrees uh temperature roughly uh, decreases is somewhere between three and five degrees per thousand feet Okay, great. So that's how you make a scatter plot. Uh, you'll be making some tonight. I'm just going to show you another example, and we'll just talk about the scales because the actual plotting is is fairly simple. So let's talk about one more example. Let's talk about scales. So uh, here's dollars spent in the gallons. I assume this is gasoline. Oh, yeah, it does say gasoline. Gasoline bought. So you're going to have your quadrant one. I've already got right there, and I, I believe I gave you 20 tick marks for this one. So we have, we have 20 actual tick marks we could use. The question is, how many will we actually need? Well, if X is the dollars spent and Y is the gallons bought, let's see what we would do for our X. The smallest number on our X is a four and the largest one looks to be 13. So I at least need to go from zero to 13. That would be 13 tick marks. And that sounds fairly reasonable. Uh, if I gave you 20 tick marks right there, you could go from zero to 13 going by ones. Uh, for the Y values, uh, smallest number is what 1.1, and the largest value is 3.3. Now, you have to start at zero, so we're going to have a little gap in our data right there. Um, so let's see. If we go by 3.3, we don't want to go by 0.1. That would be too many, but maybe 0.5 would work or something like that. So I just wanted to briefly discuss tick marks. So you would have to label your tick marks there for both your Y and your X. Now, it's perfectly fine that your X and Y have different values for each tick mark. But if you once you set a certain value for one tick mark as you go from left to right or up and down, then each tick mark must go up or down by the same value. Once again, or for last time, the Ys and the X could be different from each other, but in the Ys, all the Ys have to be the same and all the Xs have to be the same for each tick mark. All right, hopefully that made sense. So tonight for homework, they want you to make a scatter plot. All right, go moving on. So what good are scatter plots for? Well, they're to see if there are trends in the data, to see if something emerges that can tell you something. So we're going to talk about what are called trend lines. So trend lines are we construct a scatter plot, and then we draw a line through the data to represent what is happening with the data. Now, this is literally a eyeball test. This is not mathematical in the sense that I'm going to be doing a calculation. Uh, if you take a class called statistics, either in high school or in college, you will learn how to mathematically calculate what's called the line of best fit, and that would be the perfect trend line. And that's the one that would fit the data perfectly. We're just going to kind of eyeball the data and draw a line through it. That's called a trend line. So if we look at this, I, I, I think about this as... Um, uh, uh, drawing a line through the middle of the data. So let me show you what I mean right here. So if we think about the data as a, I don't know, a hot dog right here. So if we think of it like that, and I want to draw a line through the center of the data, uh, well, then that would go from, well, roughly, I don't remember, I'm doing this by eye, uh, that would kind of look something like that. And that blue line right there, the just the blue line, that would be my trend line. Now, do you need to draw the hot dog to do this? You don't. 
but we try to get the, the line that go through the middle of the data. And so roughly speaking, and this is a rough idea, you wind up with half the dots above it or below it or left of it or right of it. So if I looked to the one right here on the right, I wound up with one, two, three, four, five dots uh, above it and one, two, three, four, five dots. Now don't, don't uh, panic if it's not the same number of dots, just try to give it a good, I, good uh, guesstimate where about half the dots are uh, on either side of your trend line. Now, if your trend line, the one on the uh, left here, I'm going through a couple dots, well then, well then you're in the middle. All right, hopefully that makes sense. And I, I bet you've done this before. All right, so the next thing in homework is, well, you're gonna draw trend lines. Trend lines are not that challenging of a thing to draw themselves. But the question is, why do we actually make trend lines? Okay, so, oh, there's the nice ones right there. All right, so why do we do trend lines? Well, trend lines, well, they allows us, allows us to predict answers to questions about the values not shown in the data set. Now, that's just a statement. Uh, let me explain it to you. So let's say we had the question. There's our uh, scatter plot for altitude and temperature. Let's say we had this question that said, uh, what is the expected temperature for 2,250 meters. So if we think this through, 2,250, so here's 2,000 right here, here's 3,000, halfway would be 2,500, I'm at 2,250, so I'm right here. So there's your X value, 2,250. So if we go up through the data points, we notice there's no point that it, the data touches. So what's the purpose of a trend line? Well, the purpose of a trend line is that if we draw the trend line, now my blue line intersects the, the uh, trend line. And then if I look directly to the left of that point where the blue line, the two blue lines intersect, I can read the temperature and that's how it works. This works for both going from X to Y or from Y to X. For instance, if I wanted to do, I don't know, uh, 45 uh, degrees Fahrenheit, I could predict what temperature or what uh, altitude that would be going to go from 45 degrees to the blue line and then straight down to see what altitude that would be. And that looks like 1500 degrees or 1500 meters. Yeah, my unit's all messed up today. All right, so that's the real purpose of doing trend lines. Uh, I'm going to make this more complicated than it needs to be, but that's the general idea for trend lines. You use it to make predictions about the data set that you just made the scatter plot about. All right, so I'm saying that's about 41. Maybe it's 42, but it's certainly somewhere between 41 and 42. All right, so I'm going to use some fancy words now to describe this idea of how do you use the trend line to help you to interpret the data. So there's a scatter plot. There's my trend line. So if I'm looking to predict an answer somewhere between where the first red dot is and the last red dot that I described, we call that interpolation. And interpolation is when I'm trying to answer a question about the data, and that question is asking me about somewhere in between the first and the last dot. So I'm literally talking from left to right between the first red dot on the left and the last red dot on the right. That's called interpolation. Interpolation works great. Scientists use it all the time. And it's, it's, a, it's a solid tool, especially the more correlated the data is. You know, if it's like, you know, strong correlation, you can be darn sure that you're really close to the answer. There's a second type of prediction, and it's when you're predicting something outside of the data set. So in other words, imagine if that blue line continued going upwards uh, as we move to the right there. Well, there are no data points to the to the right of that last red dot. So therefore, we are clearly making a, a, a prediction, not based upon data, but based upon a trend line. And you got to be really careful with the next one. So interpolation always works great. We'll give you an answer. You can be really confident with your answer. But the next one is called extrapolation. You might have heard that word, extrapolate the data. So when you extrapolate, you're going to make a prediction based upon the, where the trend line is going. So if I'm outside the data set, I am actually taking a leap of faith that the trend line continues. Here's a good example. Once again, if that data set was on height or age and height, well, we know that after you reach, say, the age of 16, 17, you stop growing taller. Therefore, that trend line would stop going in an upward direction. 
but I have no data in this particular data set to back that up. All I can do is see where the trend line is going. And so therefore you have to be really careful with extrapolation, even though tonight for homework, you're not going to take that into account. I just want you to know that when you extrapolate with the data, you have to be awfully careful to make sure that you're not making some false assumption because you don't have any data to back it up. Okay. So we're going to be doing uh, interpret interpolation extrapolation. And basically you're just, um, Looking at the data set, the scatter plot, you're drawing a trend line, and then you're answering questions based upon the trend line itself. So let me explain how that works. First and foremost, you have to use the information that we had from the previous night's homework, which was writing the equation of a line. So we're going to be writing the equation of the line of that blue line, in other words, the trend line. We're going to be writing that equation and then we're going to use that equation to help us interpolate or extrapolate. Sounds complicated. It's not. All right. It is ugly numbers, though. I will, I'll grant you that. So writing equations of a trend line. So don't panic. You've done this before. You've just done it with nicer numbers than what we're about to mess with. So we're going to draw a trend line. Then we're going to pick two points that are really, really, really close to the trend line. We're going to calculate the slope. We're going to use one of the two points to help us to calculate the y-intercept, and then we're going to write the equation. And then I will use that equation to interpolate or extrapolate. Okay. So here is, uh, this is from the book, uh, it's pandas. Uh, so they have the age in months of some pandas and how much they weighed. And so we're going to make a scatter plot of that data. I'm going to not bore you, but give you the scatter plot. So there's the scatter plot, and I went ahead and drew a trend line. Now, that's just a hand-drawn trend line right there in blue. So it says draw the trend line. Done. Step number two, pick two points that are really, 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 really from the data set that are really close to the blue line. So I'm going to pick these two points right here. So I've, I've made them in red. I've also circled them in black. Those are basically on the trend line, so I could use those to calculate the slope and to calculate the y-intercept. So this is the same drill as we had for homework a couple of nights ago. Given two points, calculate the equation of the line. So calculate the slope four first. So that's y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. I'll make that first red line there uh, 0.1 and the second one 0.2. So that'd be 37.9 minus 17.1 over eight minus four. Uh, absolutely grab your calculator to help you with this. I'm gonna do the math there really quickly we get to a slope of 5.2. I'm just doing simplification of that fraction. All right. Uh, once you have the slope, now we're going to calculate the y-intercept. Remember, we choose one of those points there in red. I'm going to choose the one with the smaller number, 4 and 17.1. So 4 is your x, 17.1 is your y. Throw that with the 5.2, that's the slope, into the equation. Go to town and solve for b. 4 times 5.2, subtract 20.8 from both sides. And I get, why did I write that step twice? That's weird. Um, so B is uh, negative 3. Point, I'm going to fix that for next year. Uh, B is negative 3.7. Okay, so I got my slope of 5.2, the y-intercept of negative 3.7. I can write the equation. So they're in yellow on the bottom. That That's, that's money right there. That's what we got. Uh, that's going to help us interpolate and extrapolate. So once you have the equation of the trend line, you can figure out the weight and age for any values you want. All right. You might want to listen to that one just again, but uh, I'm going to move on now. We're going to use that equation. All right. So there's that equation I got right there. Y is equal to 5.2X minus 3.7. Now let's answer some questions. So it says, how much does a 20-month-old panda weigh? Look on the graph. There is no 20 there. We stopped at 12. Look on the table of values right there. We don't we don't have any 20. We stopped at 12. So we're going to make a prediction based upon the scatter plot. That's not between the red dots. That's way outside to the right. So this is extrapolation. We got to be careful. And by careful, we're going to do the calculation. That's not what to be calculate, uh, careful about. You just have to be careful as Am I confident that a panda is still growing between 12 and 20 months? But the actual calculation is simple. Well, let's see. Weight is the Y value. So I'm sorry, the X value. Um, age is the Y value. I said that completely backwards. Uh, X is the age. There we go. X is the age. So the 20 will be your X values and weight will be the um, Y value. Sorry for that. Um, okay, so we're going to 
just do the math here, 5.2 times 20, and then subtract 3.7. And that's my extrapolation. So my prediction is that the panda will weigh about 100 pounds. Will it weigh 100 pounds? Only if we can be assured that the data follows that trend line because we're extrapolating. If it was between the red dots, we could be 100% assured that we were awfully close to the to what the panda will weigh. But since it's way outside to the right there, well, it just depends upon whether that's true or not. As a scientist, you would gather more data and show that pandas are still gaining weight at the same trend line by the time that they're 20 months. And then we could be, uh, you know, 100% sure. Okay, they're not going to ask you that question tonight in the sense of, are you sure? They're just going to ask you to interpolate or extrapolate. Pick your values, throw them into your equation or the, the, the equation of the, of the trend line, and you'll get your answer. All right. Yeah, so uh, I'm just going to uh, just wrap this up and do one more example right here uh, and just show uh, just talk you through. So once again, the process would be this. This is that second uh, scatter plot that we had here. So once you have the scatter plot, you're going to draw a trend line. Then you're going to pick two points on your trend line, calculate the slope, calculate the y-intercept, come up with the equation. Once you make the equation of the trend line, then you're going to answer the question. So if X is your dollars spent and Y is your gallons bought, it says how many gallons would $2.50 buy? Uh, well, that would be an X value. Toss that into your equation, and it will tell you how many gallons were bought. And that's it. That's the whole lesson. Um, if you have any questions, it's a long weekend. We're not going to see each other until Tuesday. Uh, I'll check my email a couple times each day, and I certainly can answer any questions. Have a wonderful weekend, and I'll see you on Tuesday.